Today, I want to tell you about the five mistakes that I see on data analyst resumes. And I'll leave you with one good recommendation to do going ahead, as well as what you should do instead of making those five mistakes. My friends, recently I did almost 300 free resume reviews. The vast majority of them were for data analysts. This is something I like to do periodically. It helps to keep me current on trends, issues that people are doing in their resumes, problems that they're having in their career search. I asked everyone, do you have a particular question for me, some guiding thing that you want me to work on? So I got a lot of information on problems that people are having, the, the kind of concerns that they have with their resumes. Very rewarding for me. It did take a lot of time. I did get some paying customers out of it, so that's always awesome. But what I really saw was a coalescing on a handful of overall themes. And there are just, there are a handful, five to seven things that almost everybody is doing wrong with their resumes. As far as I can see, I'm far from the only expert out there. But I really wanted to hone in on some of these points so that everyone can get a taste of what's going wrong out there. Maybe you can look at your own resume if you don't want to pay for time with me. It's free content. You can look at your own resume and see, hey, are you doing this wrong? If so, I suggest there's some ways you can fix it. So without further ado, let's launch into it. The top five mistakes that I see on data analyst resumes based on the nearly 300 that I reviewed recently. The number five thing that I see going wrong with data analyst resumes is they lead with education. Let me tell you this. There's a lot of people out there that have a new degree, whether that's a bachelor's degree, master's degree, perhaps even a PhD, perhaps an associate's degree. I am sure, I got a couple of degrees myself, I am very certain that if you have a degree, especially if that degree is recent, what is very fresh in your mind is all of the hard work that you did. Bravo for that. Applaud you. Good for you for reaching for the brass ring and improving your education. However, what I will put to you is it is not likely, based on my experience and all of the resumes I've seen, it is not likely that that education is your value proposition. It is not the best thing about you and your career, the thing that's gonna get you over the hump and get you that job. Doesn't matter how impressive your education is, I didn't see any resumes from people from Harvard, probably because if you got a Harvard degree, you don't need my help with the resume. I didn't see degrees from name brand schools in the ones that I was helping with. Whether they're schools from overseas, schools from the United States, many very worthy schools on there. I'm not, I'm not talking trash about any, anyone's school. I'm proud of the schools that I went through and the degrees that I've earned. However, I have a degree from Maryland. God bless Maryland, but Maryland is not a name brand school. And I saw quite a few resumes from people with Maryland, go Terps, people from Syracuse. Syracuse is a fine school, not a name brand school. Georgia Tech, not a name brand school. Be proud of the study that you've done. Be proud of your education. However, it is unlikely that that is the thing that's going to get you a job. Instead, what I recommend is you lead with a summary. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. A summary and then probably your experience. Although for some of you, if you, if you don't have relevant experience, maybe summary skills and then experience is a better progression at the top of that resume. But most likely, if you can start that narrative with the summary and then get to your value proposition, whether that's your skills or your job experience, it's going to be better for you that way. So number five, for almost everyone, certainly every resume that I saw, leading with your education is just not a good idea, especially if you're in the U.S. and Canada job market. Can't really speak to other countries. That's why I'm not super comfortable taking business from foreign countries. I don't know your resume customs or your hiring market. 
in the U.S. and Canada, if you're trying to get a job here, trust me, your education is probably not the thing that's going to sell you. The number four mistake that I saw on data analyst resumes is playing to the ATS, the Applicant Tracking System. My friends, the Applicant Tracking System is a consideration. I'm not here to tell you that you shouldn't make your resume ATS friendly. You absolutely should. However, what I will say is the ATS gets way more attention than it deserves. There are so many of you out there freaking out about appealing to the ATS that you are making resumes that are absolute eyesores, almost unreadable, in an effort to tickle the algorithm and try and get past the ATS. I have talked to quite a few people in hiring and people that know about the applicant tracking system have experience with various ATSs because there's a bunch of them out there. Everything that I hear says that the ATS is not that big a deal. Now, there are a ton of resume writers out there that will convince you otherwise. And the reason why is that way they can sell you their expensive resume services. And all they're doing is running it through a large language model and cleaning it up, making it ATS friendly. And then you take that ATS friendly resume, apply a thousand times and get no interviews. My friends, the ATS is a very low bar to clear. And it is only the first bar to clear. If you make a resume that is an unreadable eyesore in six point font that is jam packed bumper to bumper with keyword stuffing and skill stacking, you'll clear the ATS. Sure. The minute an actual human reads your resume, you're out. Because if they look at it and it makes their eyes bleed, they're done reading. What you need instead. What I recommend is absolutely go take your resume through resume worded or job scan or one of these ATS friendly scanners and make sure you've got those keywords in there for the jobs that you want. However, your resume still needs to be appealing and readable by a human reader because chances are that's the stumbling block that you're not getting past if you're not getting interviews. Number four, stop playing so hard to the ATS. Start making a resume that looks good to an actual reader. The number three biggest problem that I see in data analyst resumes is projects with no impact. The vast majority of analysts that I see putting a project section on their resume are doing so without any inkling of how that project section may appeal to a hiring manager or some sort of business. What I mean by that is you're playing fun with numbers. You're out there doing projects that the data has no business relevance. You're looking at video game sales. You're looking at sports statistics near and dear to my heart, but it's not super compelling unless you are trying to get an extremely competitive job in sports analytics. You're, you're playing games with numbers. And even if you are using business relevant data, your write up of the project on your resume doesn't speak to what you accomplished. My friends, having projects is great. Doing, having interest in data is a wonderful thing. Whatever gets you up in the morning and playing with numbers is a positive. Here are the steps that I recommend. Number one, use business relevant data. There's plenty of data sets on Kaggle, on data.gov, on the Cal Irvine machine learning repository. All of these places have business relevant data. You can use marketing data, manufacturing data, sales, retail sales data. All of these things, whatever domain you're in, real estate, whatever domain you're going into in data, you can find sets that pertain to that. So you're using business relevant data. And if you do some sort of challenge or well-worn problem, show what impacts you had and make it something beyond, hey, I improved the model accuracy by 10%. How much profit do you stand to gain for a business with the impact of that project? How, many, how much would you cut costs? How much efficiency would you gain? How many work hours would you cut out? Anything like that that shows the impact or even the potential impact of a project that you had 
shows that you understand a business problem and the KPIs that actually matter to somebody that might want to hire you. That's appealing to a business. Talking about the ratings of Super Mario Brothers games, not so much. Make sure you write up your project section, if you have one, with actual tangible impacts, even if they're only potential impacts, because I know most of these projects are academic. academic. The number two mistake that I see data analysts make on their resumes, and this may come as a surprise because this was my number one until recently, activities, not accomplishments. Bottom line, you're listing things on your resume that are just daily grind things. And I get the appeal. I understand why this happens. The reason why it happens is because the vast majority of your time and your energy was probably spent doing these regular day-to-day -day tasks. Sometimes 70, 80% of your time and effort went into answering emails and going to meetings and organizing tasks and just boring stuff. So you associate your emotion and your sense of accomplishment with doing these things over and over, and you feel like you should quantify that. This gets particularly bad. People don't have quantifiable metrics. They didn't measure the impact of their work. So they think, I can get some numbers on my resume by saying I did task X 500 times without screwing it up. My bottom line is, if doing task X one time was not an accomplishment, doing it 500 times without screwing it up, also not an accomplishment. Don't go in for aggregate metrics. Don't try and count your mundane day-to-day -day tasks as some sort of accomplishment on your resume. Instead, get concrete metrics or measurables if you can, but if not, still describe your accomplishments. Those projects that you did that had a beginning, middle, and end, you saw something through to completion, and you can verbally summarize the impact of it. Not every impact has to be a number on a KPI, you raised revenue, you solved world hunger, you cut man hours, something like that. It doesn't always have to be like that. And hiring managers understand not every resume is going to be number, 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 percentage KPI, percentage KPI, millions of dollars, that sort of thing. Not everybody has those impacts of their work. More people do than think they do, and that's a problem for another time. But what you can do is describe your accomplishments verbally, but be focused on the specific achievements that you had, not necessarily on coming in in the morning, making the coffee, and answering your emails. The number one mistake that I see data analysts making on their resumes right now is fake metrics. My friends, I hate to break it to you, we've got a new number one with a rocket, as Rick Dees used to say. It used to be activities, not accomplishments. The new number one problem that I see on resumes is people are quoting fake metrics, and I'll tell you why. It's all about AI. People are feeding their old resume into ChatGPT after applying a hundred times and getting no interviews. And they're saying, save me, write it better, appeal to the ATS, whatever it is. What ChatGPT generally spits back at you, or whatever AI or large language model you choose to use, what it'll give back to you is a resume that looks like a successful resume. Successful resumes, as I said earlier, have specific accomplishments on them. Hopefully, measurable, quantifiable accomplishments. The large language model knows that. The AI knows that successful resumes look like I moved the needle on a KPI. I saved X dollars. I improved efficiency by 10%. And so it writes those things in. The average job seeker sees that, thinks that it's okay. Everybody must be doing it. And so they start applying with that resume. My friends, I see this over and over again. Now, what I will say is this is not quite as common as the problem of people summarizing mundane tasks and listing activities, not accomplishments. 
However, it's a much more serious one, and here's why. You are quite literally lying on your resume. If you let ChatGPT say that you improved operational efficiency by 25% at every job you went to, that's fake. You didn't do that. You probably can't even define what that means. I actually ran a poll recently asking people, hey, what's operational efficiency? One person managed to give me some sort of answer. Still didn't satisfy me that most people aren't lying about it on their resumes. Whether you wrote it in or whether an AI wrote it in for you, you are presenting that resume, you own every word on it, and that is a lie. Instead, what I recommend is, first of all, if you're having AI help you with your resume, check it carefully. You can write prompts for the AI that say, do not make up any information that I don't give you. You got to be careful because they will still do that sometimes. And you just, all you have to do is fire them a little question like, hey, where'd you get that 25% operational efficiency gain from? It says, oops, I'm sorry. You don't have to go too far on the internet to find example after example of people that have caught ChatGPT or any other AI in blatant lies, propaganda, bias, crazy stuff. There's a lot of weird things in the algorithms these days. And if you don't know that, well, you've probably been living under a rock. My recommendation is estimate your impacts. You don't need numbers in everything, and having a number that you can't explain is a death sentence for your application. The other thing is, this is one of about four or five distinct hallmarks of AI-generated resumes. Now, I've reviewed about a thousand resumes in the past year or so. If I've reviewed a thousand, your average hiring manager has probably seen several thousand. Trust me when I tell you, I can spot an AI-generated resume a mile away, and so can they. So if ChatGPT writes your resume, and you don't validate the metrics that are in it, and you then apply a thousand times and get no interviews, doesn't take too much imagination to figure out why. My friends, I told you I'd leave you with one best practice recommendation. Now, I do have a book coming out very soon about how to write resumes, including how to constructively use AI to help you with that, not to put lies into your resume. But that thing will be chock full of positive recommendations. I'll give you one here today. Always lead with value talked about this a little bit earlier. My suggestion is you go summary experience or summary skills experience. But the bottom line is whatever your main selling point is, that should be at the top of your resume. As the reader goes through your resume, you start to lose their focus and attention. Everybody talks about these metrics like hiring managers read the average resume for seven or eight seconds. What I can tell you is the average person that's read a thousand resumes only needs seven or eight seconds to figure out if the resume is any good. So that average actually might be a little bit high. If the resume is good, they're going to read it longer. If it's not, they can usually tell in five seconds and it's going in the round five. So my recommendation is whatever your selling point is for that job, lead with that. Go in that order. And the only thing beyond that is... Your education probably ain't it. Friends, I hope that was helpful to you. Please, if you like this content, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Please leave us a comment in comments. Good, bad, indifferent. It all helps, and we will do better going forward. With that, Semper Fidelis, and I'll talk to you later.